Yes? Okay. Thank you so much for the invitation to join you today. Um, this has been such an energizing uh, day so far, and yesterday was as well. I should tell you that today is actually my last stop on what's been kind of a whirlwind tour of education in Shanghai. I've been here for close to two weeks, and I'm literally leaving from here to head to the airport. So this is my last stop, and I can't imagine a better way um, to close than by uh, being around people doing such amazing, important work and hearing um, all the wonderful things that are happening. So I'm going to talk a little bit about project-based learning in terms of some of the global trends that I've been seeing um, in my work and in my writing, and what some of the opportunities as well as challenges are to take this approach to a broader audience. So among my affiliations, I'm part of the national faculty of an organization in the US called PBL Works. And it's been a long time uh, promoter of project-based learning strategies, teacher training, materials, uh, resources online, et cetera, and continues to grow and expand. Um, and I do a lot of writing with them, and I'm excited to say that my most recent book uh, with PBL Works is going to be released in China next year. So I'm excited about that. So what we're seeing is a really global surge of interest in project-based learning. When we have conferences in the U.S., we have attendees, teachers from all around the world who are looking for ideas and looking to get this approach to teaching and learning started in their homes, in their schools, in their communities. And in my own work um, as a consultant and advocate of project-based learning, I've worked with educators on just about every continent. I haven't made it to Africa yet. Antarctica is a little out of reach yet, uh, but pretty much everywhere else. And what we're seeing is this explosion of interest. So I wanted to talk a little bit about why PBL as an instructional strategy is becoming so popular and how we can make the most of it. So first, let's think about PBL as an innovation. Even though in some ways project-based learning is not a brand new idea, the idea of uh, learning by doing has been with us for a very long time, but I think the current understandings about PBL, the current uh, way to implement projects with students in a very effective way, that is rather new, and particularly to do this with technology to um, really maximize the learning opportunities and have students be opportunities to be problem solvers, to be creators, uh, using technology in really purposeful ways, and sometimes creating technologies themselves. So early on in the US, we had our, our innovators and our early adopters. Sometimes it was a single teacher who saw this as a great way to teach. Eventually, among our, our early adopters were networks of schools, like High Tech High and some others, that were doing project-based learning all the time, wall to wall, every course was delivered through a project-based experience. What we're seeing now is we get in the US more to this early majority phase. Instead of schools that do only project-based learning, we've, we tend to have schools doing some projects um, uh, consistently, but not the only way they're teaching. So a student might experience a couple of projects a year or a couple of projects in a semester, and in between there might be some more traditional teaching. So we're seeing a little bit more of a blend of strategies um, at this point. And what I'm seeing in China is lots of early adopters. Um, I'm going to be eager to see how this strategy um, takes hold and grows till we get to the top of that curve and down the other side, bring everyone along with us. I think it's important to think about why project-based learning um, is having such wide appeal. One of our writers in the U.S., Simon Sinek, it reminds us to start with why and think about what's your why. If you're going to embrace a, a strategy like project-based learning, it means teaching in different ways. It means sometimes organizing schools in different ways. It means students thinking and learning in different ways. So what makes this worth the effort? Some of the reasons, uh, some of the whys we've heard uh, in our, our research about project-based learning, these are some of the key ones. Higher student engagement. We find that students feel there's more of a purpose to their learning when they're doing project-based learning. They tend to stop asking, when are we going to need to learn this? Why would we ever want to study this? They understand the purpose for what they're learning when it's a meaningful project. Um, we see project-based learning being embraced because it's better preparation for not only the academic understanding students will need for the future, but the additional skills, the ability to collaborate, to think creatively, to solve problems, um, to think critically, to get your ideas across. 
all of that is preparation, not just for college, uh, not just for careers, but really for life, for being an active member of your community, being someone who can recognize a problem and know what to do about it or seize on an opportunity. Uh, research is showing that, that PBL, when done well, we'll talk about that in a minute, the doing it well part, when it's done well, it leads to deeper learning. This means students retain knowledge for a longer, and they're actually able to take what they've learned and apply it so they can transfer it to a new situation, a new context. So it really becomes kind of part of their, their understanding. Sometimes we see strong community connections uh, through projects that, that have students engaging with their community and with people in their community. And I think an exciting one is that we, we see increased teacher satisfaction when teachers have a chance to learn how to become effective project-based teachers, they often tell us it's a more rewarding way to teach, reminds them why they got into teaching in the first place, they know their students better, all those sorts of answers come up. And I think an additional motivation for many schools is, for whatever reason, perhaps a school is undergoing a shift, a new vision, and it, that may have to do with STEAM or STEM or a makerspace that uh, the school really wants students to be able to take advantage of. So you have to think about how are we going to use that new opportunity? How are we going to bring this into the day-to-day the -day experience of teaching and learning? And project-based learning provides a framework to make those connections. So there are lots of motivations. It's worth thinking about what's driving you in this direction with your um, community of learners. So my colleagues at uh, PBL Works, the group I mentioned earlier, um, we asked a big question, a big driving question a couple of years ago. And, and it was about how can we design, help teachers design for the most effective learning experiences in PBL. We asked this question because we were seeing a big range of outcomes. We would see some projects that were just exceptional, extraordinary learning experiences. But we'd see others and talk with students about what they had learned or what they hadn't understood. And we wondered, was this really the best use of time? So there was a huge range of quality when it came to the learning experience. And we wanted to help teachers think about how can we design for high quality experiences? So we came up with a, a framework, the gold standard PBL framework, uh, boldly calling it that, uh, with seven essential project design elements. And I'll just talk about this very briefly. There's lots of information online to dig into this more deeply. But I'll let you know that this framework came about and the, the book that accompanies it, that it kind of explains the whole story, um, came about through a big collaborative conversation. We spoke with teachers around the world. We spoke with researchers, teachers, parents, uh, deliverers of professional development, really tried to get a multifaceted view to come to some common understanding of what is PBL when you're doing it well, when you're setting the stage for the, the best possible learning experience for your students. We know that it starts with a learning goal right at the center, learning goals, that projects in the K-12 context, that's where I'm focusing my, uh, my talk today is K-12, um, projects in that context are connected to uh, learning goals, whether that's your national curriculum or whether it's local standards like we have in the U.S., um, but there are strong learning goals. So teachers are starting with the end in mind. They're anticipating what will students know and be able to do by the end of this experience. And that means not just the knowledge and understanding they'll gain, but also what are some of those success skills like collaboration or critical thinking that we can deepen along the way. The teachers get very focused on specific learning goals, and then they embark on this experience with students. They kind of invite them, uh, invite students to join them in a learning experience together, starting with a challenging question. There's often some sort of a kickoff event that gets students' questions going right off the bat, ignites curiosity. It's a question that's rich and open-ended. There could be multiple wonderful solutions to that question. Um, students couldn't go figure it out by doing some online research quickly, or as we would say in the US, you can't just Google it. Um, then the process is, is off and running. Students are asking more questions. They're digging deeper through sustained inquiry, or as uh, other parts of the world say, inquiry. In the US, we say inquiry. Um, projects that work best have a feel of being real to students. So we talk about the importance of authenticity. Students have decisions to make along the way. So we talk about them having voice and choice. They reflect on their learning throughout the experience as well as at the end, looking backwards. There's critique and revision. So as I was hearing this morning about uh, the use of design thinking, uh, the language of prototyping, this is very much consistent with PBL. 
where we know that students don't do their best work on one try or great ideas don't happen on the first pass. So you build in time for critique, revision, prototyping, and that's true whether it's a physical object that students are producing um, to show what they know or can do with this information, or whether it's an idea, something that they're going to convey in uh, perhaps in, in written form um, or in a speech that they're going to give. So throughout this whole process, students are inquiring to learn, they're digging deep, they're learning new um, knowledge, then they're applying that to create something that represents their thinking. The, whatever they're creating, the final product that they're creating um, with their teammates demonstrates what they know, and it also responds right back to that initial driving question. It's an answer to that driving question. Here's our solution to this problem that we've investigated. And then they share it with an audience that's going to care about it. And in a nutshell, that's the PBL experience. Whether it lasts for two weeks or whether it lasts for a whole semester, all of these elements really matter in terms of designing an effective learning experience. So let's dig in a little bit more with a, another driving question about how can we make sure our students really um, experience these benefits. And I just want to talk through a few strategies for uh, any K-12 teachers in the room to pay attention to as you're going into PBL. One strategy is to avoid what we call dessert projects. That means you've learned in a traditional way, uh, very teacher-driven, and then at the end of that experience, let's do a project to kind of cement the learning or celebrate the learning. It often is hands-on, might be something like a diorama to learn about habitats, make sure you have some, uh, something to sort of celebrate your learning. That's not project-based learning. That's a teacher-driven learning experience with a nice activity at the end. What we want to see in project-based learning is that inquiry throughout, diving deep, uh, students making decisions, not being told you're going to make a diorama just like everyone else in class. Instead, let's think about learning about habitats by collaborating with a local zoo. Um, this is from a city that had some new funding to add uh, animal habitats. And so the student's project to learn about ecosystems and habitats was to come up with some prototypes of what those new habitats should look like. And they had to think about how would these habitats be beneficial for the animals that would live in them, and how would they appeal to the human visitors who interact at the zoo. Uh, so they thought hard, as designers do, and then presented their, their prototypes with the staff of the zoo. So they really reached an audience that cared about what they had to say. Imagine being a zoo designer and getting to hear what makes zoo experiences meaningful um, to students, the young people who spend a lot of their time there. So why not? Listen to what students have to say when you're in the middle of a big project. So avoid those dessert projects. Look for the full extended PBL deep dive. Um, another strategy is to really focus your project on meaningful content. Don't just kind of go off to the side of the, your content. For example, if you're teaching mathematics and you see students aren't that interested in the math, the actual work of doing math, you might think, okay, well, I'll make this more fun by having them do a little research about famous mathematicians. Well, that might be a nice activity. It's nice to know about how different uh, mathematical theories and principles came about, but it doesn't have students doing the real work of mathematicians. So I wouldn't consider that a really solid PBL experience. Again, let's compare. Imagine your students are in a uh, pre-AP calculus class, is where I saw this example, and they're uh, interviewing real clients about their financial goals. And then they're having to think in the way that financial planners do to come up with a financial plan uh, using data and uh, kind of budget materials that uh, they've, uh, ex you know, gotten from the client. So they're using the client's real household budget information and the client's real goals. They're thinking hard about how do we save for different um, needs at different rates and different time periods and all of those sorts of things having to uh, think a lot about functions and how to bring them together, how to represent that in a way the client will understand, and then sharing that information with the client. So in that case, they're doing the work of mathematicians. They're not learning about, oh, here's who mathematicians are. They are in the role of mathematicians themselves, serving the needs of real clients who care about what they come up with. A third strategy is to really encourage student-driven learning. And for many teachers, this is one of the big changes and challenges with PBL. Um, teachers are kind of used to being 
up here where I am, you know, in front of the class. In project-based learning, you're much more likely to be learning alongside your students and learning together. And you may have to help your students with some ways to be more in charge of their own learning. Um, on my first day here, the, uh, feels like a lifetime ago, one day last week, one of the first questions a teacher asked was, but our students don't ask questions. They expect the teacher to ask questions. So how can we do PBL? Um, and so that was an opportunity to talk about how do you get students to start asking questions? How do you scaffold the, the questioning experience? How do you model that? And gradually, as students have repeat experiences with PBL, they get much better at driving their own learning, which is a life goal, you know, a life skill. They can take beyond the classroom into future challenges and think about what do I need to learn to solve a problem or to take advantage of an opportunity ahead. Um, and finally, we encourage you to focus on not just the academic side, but also those success skills. Um, we've been hearing a lot today, this morning, about um, how in the, the fab labs, learning's happening in the open. It's happening very collaboratively. Um, it's requiring people to think critically about potential solutions. What's the best solution for a problem? The best way to come at it. Those are all what we would call either 21st century skills or soft skills. These are the non-academic skills that are just essential for students to um, develop so that they're going to be ready for the challenges ahead. So we really emphasize those in project-based learning as well, to not just say that we're going to develop collaboration in a project, but break it down for students, help them learn how to collaborate, how to create a team, how to hold each other responsible, um, how to disagree uh, in a way that doesn't end friendships, all those things that are so important. And we may have to teach those skills deliberately in project-based learning when this is new to students. So those are a few strategies. I want to talk briefly about the teacher's role, because those tended to be, what's the student doing? Um, so we know that, that project-based learning is not just one thing. It's not just one way to teach. It's a collection of teaching practices. Some are teacher-centered, driven by a teacher. Some are student-centered. And so it, it's this combination. Um, we know from, from research, uh, looking at education broadly, not just PBL, but education broadly, there's great research on what are those most high-impact teaching strategies. What are the instructional strategies that set the stage and lead students to great learning experiences, regardless of whether it's PBL or in a more traditional setting? All of these are uh, very high-impact strategies. And I'd argue that you cannot do project-based learning without incorporating these strategies. So let me just go through these quickly. Setting high expectations for all your students. Building relationships with your students, getting to know each other, establishing a culture, uh, making sure your students have frequent feedback, not just from you, but from their peers, and then time to put it to use. And then really teaching them how to learn. We describe it as the deliberate uh, teaching of learning strategies. So helping students think about how am I progressing as a learning? How am I learning? Uh, what are the strategies that are going to support me, not just in this project, but in my next challenges? Um, so we talked about, we did another research project, thinking about the teacher's role. There are some uh, resources that I'll share with you in a moment that point to these. So getting started with PBL, uh, I want to just share this one website, this one link with you. This is pblworks.org. And what you'll find here are a lot of resources. Uh, you'll find lots and lots of project examples. It can be a great starting point. You can go here and look at how other teachers in your grade level or content area have structured a project and hear their reflections. You can watch video case studies and see PBL in action from start to finish and find lots of planning tools um, to support you. Um, I'm going to kind of zip along here because time is running out. I think maybe I'll just close with one final example that to me kind of um, shows the connection of PBL and, and the STEAM opportunities. So this young woman I met, uh, she had just come out of a science project. Look what she's holding up there. These are masks for a theater performance. The, the task ahead in science was material science. How can you combine elements to create different materials that have different uh, characteristics and qualities? The teacher had an assignment in mind, the way he had always taught this before. But this young woman had a sense of agency, and she said, you know, what I love is theater. I love drama. I want to spend my life working backstage, designing sets and costumes. Can I? make some masks for our next production that will demonstrate what I understand about material science. 
And the teacher was a little bit unnerved at first because he's a science teacher, didn't know much about drama, but he agreed to let her uh, pursue uh, this pursuit. And, you know, I think the, her picture speaks, uh, speaks volumes uh, because there's that satisfaction uh, that she understands deeply. Uh, she has pride of what she accomplished. And I think she surprised her teacher as well as herself at how much science uh, she learned and uh, how she was able to document her learning by keeping things like a, a lab notebook, doing experiments, many of the things that he wanted all of his students doing. But she had enough voice and choice and confidence to say, I'm going to get to these learning goals, but can I do it in a different way? Can I demonstrate my learning in a different way? And I think the more opportunities students have to engage in these sorts of learning experiences, the more we're going to have students uh, with that kind of confidence. So thank you very much. I literally am heading to the airport right now. Um, but I, I so appreciate the chance to uh, meet with many of you individually and um, just have some time together. So thank you.